All right. Well, uh, what a pleasure, uh, Professor Levy, to get to talk with you about your latest book, Breaking Down Barriers, George McLaurin and the Struggle to End Segregated Education. Uh, just so uh, our audience is fully aware, uh, Professor Levy is the uh, Irene and Julian Rothbaum Professor of Modern American History and David Ross Boyd Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, has been my uh, colleague and friend for uh, my 10 years at uh, the University of Oklahoma. And I'll begin by uh, stating uh, the uh, obvious for our audience. If you care uh, about the University of Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma, uh, the history of racial segregation and desegregation in America, then you simply must read this book. Once you've started, you'll find the book hard to put down. And once you finish, you'll have learned a great deal about our state, our university, and the larger national landscape of race relations. So I wanna begin by thanking you uh, for this fantastic book, Breaking Down Barriers. Uh, that's very kind of you, David, and uh, uh, I want to uh, say how much I appreciate you doing this with me because I know you're extremely busy as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the uh, busiest and the largest college at the university, and uh, probably have other things on your mind, but well, very, uh, it's always a very, pleasure. Very, very happy to, 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 to do this, and... Uh... Uh, I'm hoping the college will be in safe hands for the next uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> so the, the book opens with your recounting of that powerful episode featured on the book's cover, uh, those pictures of George McLaurin. Uh, you described him as breathtaking, horrifying, devastating, heartbreaking, the elderly man sitting alone, serious and dignified, and dressed in a suit and tie. Uh, the white students looking indifferent, as if they were somehow superior and knew it as if the old black man was not quite worthy of their notice. Talk us through how we got to that point where McLaurin was able to sit in room 104 of the old Carnegie Library, home then to the College of Education. Well, um, black citizens of Oklahoma had always uh, resisted <clears throat> formalized uh, segregation and exclusion and uh, second, the second class citizenship that was imposed uh, upon them uh, from the beginning of uh, territorial settlement uh, 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 until uh, for a long time. And uh, it's hard to know where to begin the story, but as far as education is concerned, <clears throat> I think one would start with, uh, at the university, I think one would start with uh, Ada Scipio uh, Fisher, uh, who came to uh, Dr. Cross's office in uh, 1946, asking to be admitted to the law school and was told that by state law, uh, that was impossible that led to uh, uh, a Supreme Court decision two years later that said if uh, uh, the university, if the state was going to offer a legal education to white people, it had to either offer it also to African-Americans or stop offering it to whites. Uh, and while that case was uh, being adjudicated, uh, George McLaurin and uh, five other uh, African-Americans, all of them with uh, bachelor's degrees and a couple of them with MAs, uh, decided to uh, uh, press the university to let them study topics that subjects that were not available to them in the all black university at Langston. Uh, and uh, the NAACP chose McLaurin uh, to be the one to uh, uh, bring the uh, legal procedures that would lead to his admission. Yeah. Um, why they chose him is not clear. Uh, he was uh, at the time 61 years old I think part of their reasoning was that uh, 
uh, no one would accuse him of uh, uh, coming to the university to prey on white uh, co-eds. He was happily married with uh, three uh, mature and quite successful children. And uh, uh, he had shown that he was able to do graduate work by earning a master's degree at uh, uh, the University of Kansas. Uh, but in any case, they, they picked him to uh, make those first steps to room 104, the uh, Carnegie building. Thank you, thank you. So McLaurin is, he's something of an elusive figure. We, we don't know nearly as much about him as we'd like to. We know that he claimed to be younger than he actually was. Um, you seem to have found about everything there is out there to find about McLaurin. Can you give us a sense of this dignified man who seemed to work very hard to avoid the spotlight, even when he stood at the center of the national debate about black access to higher education. Yeah, he's, uh, he is, as you say, uh, elusive. Uh, uh, what we know about him is mostly available through public documents like the Social Security Administration. <clears throat> he registered for the draft for World War I uh, he appears in censuses. I don't know where he was born, except that it was Mississippi. Uh, I, I think he came to Oklahoma in 1912. Uh, on the other hand, he's also registered as a uh, student uh, uh, in Mississippi uh, for 1912-1913. Uh, he uh, to use uh, the uh, honest word, he lied about his age all the time. Uh, uh, he, uh, oh, the truth is, uh, there were people at the NAACP who uh, grew to not like him. Uh, they thought he was. Uh, uh, too demanding of uh, support uh, for uh, his effort. Uh, they uh, thought his testimony in Oklahoma City in an early stage of the uh, legal case was uh, unconvincing and uh, he, he was uh, not what you would call a very uh, a great student. He was an adequate student. Uh, there was, the, shall I mention that there was this embarrassing moment after the uh, case where he was uh, arrested. That's right. Uh, That's right. He was a he was a landlord as well. He was a landlord in a town called Holden, uh, where uh, he had once been a principal of the high school, and had acquired an apartment building, and uh, uh, he had. According to the uh, newspaper article, uh, he had been warned two or three times about providing toilet facilities for the tenants. And finally they uh, uh, took action. And uh, so, but uh, part of his attraction for me is his ordinariness. Uh, mm -hmm. He's not Hercules. Uh, he's not uh, George Washington or uh, Right. He's not Ada Fisher, Ada Scipio. Yeah. He's uh, just a regular guy. Right. He doesn't seem to have that, uh, uh, that, that uh, quality, that ease in, in public settings that, uh, that yeah. Fisher had. Uh, there's, he's not a charismatic figure. But there's yeah. one quite telling moment that you describe when... Uh, some reporters came to, to the house and asked him for a statement. Uh, and this is uh, after the decision is rendered uh, in 1950. And he has a statement typed out and he actually asks uh, uh, his, uh, his wife, Penina, to uh, get a copy of the statement for him. 
and the reporter is saying, no, no, I, I want it from the heart. I, I, uh, I, I want you to tell us what you're feeling. And can, can you tell us how, how he responds to that? It's a pretty telling yeah. moment that suggests he knew what the stakes were. Yeah. Well, he said uh, a colored man, his term, in uh, Oklahoma has to be careful to dot uh, the I's and cross the T's because uh, somebody is going to, if I make a grammatical error, somebody's going to say, uh, uh, this is the guy who wants to go to graduate school. And so he was uh, terribly careful about, uh, about that. He was careful about the way he dressed. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> he was cautious about his relations with the other students, always courteous and uh, um, but you had the sense that he was always on his guard. Yeah. And then two weeks later, he's, he gets arrested, a, a far more embarrassing moment than uh, uh, misplacing a comma in a written statement. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a certain irony there. And of course, the uh, uh, Oklahoma uh, newspaper jumped on the fact that he was arrested right publicized it yeah so uh there are several other key figures in in the study uh so uh certainly uh george's wife penina crops up periodically uh, uh ada uh, uh ada lois uh, sipwell fisher uh p appears periodically thurgood marshall uh, is certainly there at the center of the story during the legal proceedings. Towards the end of the book, uh, Dr. George Henderson uh, it, it emerges not just as a historical source, but uh, as, uh, as a character in the story. But there's one other uh, figure who uh, is positioned by you, I think, very subtly at the center of events. Uh, and, you know, maybe... Uh, in some ways, a sort of uh, parallel to McLaurin and his efforts to be very careful uh, and to, to navigate a very, very difficult situation. And this character was trying to navigate a path forward for the university in a state that was very much committed to racial segregation. The character, of course, was George Lynn Cross. Can you tell us uh, a little about Cross and that delicate balancing act that he was engaged in? Uh, yeah, good question, uh, David. Uh, let me remark at the beginning that when I finished this book, I was, uh, I felt enormous admiration for two people. Thurgood Marshall, who was a genius yeah. and who, uh, did not know the meaning of the word fear uh, and whose appearances in court were breathtaking. And the second is George Lynn Cross, uh, who I knew personally uh, actually quite well. Uh, when I uh, took on the job of writing the university's history. I was introduced to uh, Cross who had retired uh, and we had coffee after that almost every Saturday morning for six or seven years. Uh, Cross was uh, born in South Dakota. He went to the University of South Dakota. He played football and he played football with blacks uh, so he was no stranger to uh, African Americans. Uh, he uh, fell in love with botany, uh, was on his way to a promising career in botany by a series of fortuitous uh, accidents and relationships. He ended up at the University of Oklahoma in 1934 as a, a professor of, of botany. Uh, and uh, very quickly, uh, it was discovered that he had a talent for judicious uh, and thoughtful uh, administration. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he uh, he had a unique talent for thinking about alternative to policy suggestions and weighing the consequences of them. Yeah. If we do this, then what could happen? Well, two or three possibilities. And he would think about each of them. One of his favorite words I, I, I find when I read his uh, work is uh, the word reflection, meaning uh, thoughtfulness. Uh, uh, well, uh, he favored, uh, without question, the uh, breakdown of segregation and the integration of Blacks at the university. And he was faced with an environment that uh, was hostile to that idea. Uh, and uh, like any university president, he was at the uh, mercy of uh, any four regents who decided to terminate his position. So it was like uh, walking on a tightrope between uh, wanting to be helpful to uh, Fisher, to Ada Scipio Fisher and to George McLaurin, and at the same time, uh, not uh, uh, r raising the ire of uh, the legislature, the regents or the public. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know how he did it, but uh, he did. The, one of the best sources for uh, my book was uh, his uh, presidential papers. He kept every piece of paper, including the furious letters that came to him on both sides of the question. People who uh, called him uh, every name in the book uh, because they favored uh, segregation or because they oppose segregation. Yeah, you have, uh, you have a chapter devoted to those communications uh, uh, with uh, or directed at Cross, uh, a chapter called The People Speak. And uh, there's, there's a, a moment there, I mean, as a, as a reader, you, you feel for Cross because you know that he's trying to thread a needle here with the best of all possible intentions to move uh, yeah. this university forward, and that the forces that he's facing are incredibly uh, complicated uh, and difficult uh, to navigate, yet he finds a way. And one, one writer uh, sends uh, uh, across a copy of that famous picture that's on the cover of the book uh, from his Seattle newspaper and writes, it's certain that education in your college hasn't progressed since the founding of the college. Your policy of segregating Negroes is ignorant and shameful. And it, you, as a reader, you're thinking of, of George Lane Cross reading these communications, knowing what it is that, that he's trying to do and knowing, that how knowing how complicated it is to move the university forward. It must have been very difficult yeah. for him as president. Yes, and uh, he answers these letters. It's it may be not the extreme crazy ones that right. are just racist, awful racist uh, writing. But he always begins by saying, thank you for your concern about uh, these uh, important questions. Uh, um, and uh, then he gives his view as politely as possible uh, Often they're asking him to do things beyond his power. Uh, and he explains why he can't and so on. Uh, Yet he was proactive, right? In terms of moving the legal ball forward. Yeah, uh, right. He was uh, proactive at, at some very critical moments. The, the key moment uh, was uh, uh, when uh, <clears throat> Ada Scipio, uh, came to his office in January of 1946 with the uh, members of the NAACP on both sides sitting across the desk from Cross and uh, uh, him 
and, and her asking to be admitted to the law school uh, and him saying state law uh, prohibits me from saying yes. And they say, uh, they saying, we know that. Uh, we don't expect you to say yes. What we want from you is a letter in which you say, the only, we're saying no, but the only reason we're saying no is because of your race. Your credentials are fine. You're an honor student at Langston. You're smart, but uh, you're the wrong color. Uh, and Cross, uh, without hesitation, dictated the letter while they were sitting there and uh, to his secretary saying exactly what they wanted uh, uh, them uh, what he wanted, they wanted him to say, and uh, uh, the secretary went off to have it typed, and uh, uh, he said to the three who were uh, waiting for the letter to come back, I'm on your side, and uh, I'll do anything I can to help you get it to court. And then that next night, uh, the leader of the NAACP in Oklahoma, Roscoe Dungy, wrote to the Washington, to the New York office of the organization, Cross is on our side. He can't say so out loud, but he's going to help us in any way he can quietly. You must not repeat this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cross was, uh, you know, I, I trying to uh, be balanced about it and not sound like hero worship, but I really think he was a great man. Yeah. Well, I think that comes, that comes out in, in the book that he, he navigated this very difficult situation carefully uh, and smartly. He knew what he wanted the outcome to be. That outcome was absolutely in alignment with uh, what the NAACP uh, hoped for, uh, but Cross uh, had a very, very good understanding of uh, what he was facing in terms of state law, state regent, state legislature, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and university uh, regents, and yeah. he seemed to work work diligently to to move things forward, even at those moments when he was being criticized for not uh, being vocal enough. In, yeah, um, uh, you, you have time for a story that's not in the book. Sure. Uh, before these cases, uh, the uh, AF of L CIO in Oklahoma held a meeting uh, on the campus, on the North Base, in a building on the North Base. And uh, there were ropes separating the uh, uh, white and the black uh, uh, unionists in the room. And some of the unionists took down the rope and the blacks and whites mingled. Uh, Thurman White, who was uh, uh, a vice president of the university called Cross and said, look, you ought to know that this is happening. It's against the law, uh, but a, a white, so Cross uh, drove down to, drove up to the North base and uh, saw what was happening. And he said, according to Thurman White, this is one of the proudest days of my life, mm -hmm. seeing uh, blacks and whites together in the same. So. Yeah, you certainly get, get the impression from the book that, uh, that President Cross's heart was in the right place and he was just working to, to navigate uh, a yeah. pathway forward. And he was taking a lot of criticism as, as he as he did so. Um, yeah. So speaking of the big uh, decisions here, the book builds up to uh, that decision handed down by the Supreme Court on Monday, June fifth, uh, nineteen fifty. And it was not a single case, McLaurin's case. It was three connected uh, cases. Could you uh, tell our our audience about those three uh, cases? and why they were all so important together. Yes. Um, one of the cases had nothing to do with the NAACP. It arose uh, uh, separately. It was the case of Elmer Henderson, 
who uh, got on a train from Washington, D.C. to, I think, Alabama. And the policy of the railroad was uh, to separate uh, uh, people, uh, blacks and whites, in the uh, dining car. And the rule, as I remember it, was uh, that there would be a uh, table set aside for blacks who wanted to eat. Uh, but if the white section got full, then uh, white people could occupy those black seats. Well, he went to eat and uh, was told, uh, sorry, uh, all the seats are taken by uh, whites, uh, but we'll call you uh, when one comes empty. And he went back two or three times to uh, eat and each time he couldn't. And so he brought a case. Uh, uh, it was called Henderson versus uh, the Southern Railroad, I think. Uh, so that came to the Supreme Court quite irrespective of the NAACP. The second case was called uh, Sweat uh, versus Painter. Sweat was a young male man postal delivery man in, in Texas who wanted to go to law school much as Mrs. Fisher did. Mrs. Fisher, by the way, was at this time waiting in the court system for her verdict. But the Sweat case is very much like uh, uh, Fisher's case. Uh, Texas was unwilling to admit uh, him to the great law school at the University of Texas, Austin. They uh, tried to uh, avoid that by creating these dingy second rate uh, school for blacks who wanted to go to law school and sweat sued on the grounds that these two uh, schools were not equal. And that uh, uh, as uh, one of the justices said, anybody who had a choice uh, wouldn't have a hard time deciding whether to go to Austin or to this school for blacks. And the third case was uh, McLaurin, who was uh, admitted to the all white school, but was uh, kept separate from the white students as far as uh, was possible. Right. And they all came together on, they were argued on the same day, April 3rd, 4th, uh, 1950, and decided. Uh, each one of them unanimously uh, by the Supreme Court on June 5th, uh, 1950, as you say, and the New Republic said uh, June 5, 1950 uh, should be marked as uh, a day important in the history of American democracy. Yeah, and you you uh, point in, in the book to uh, what are referred to as sort of intangibles uh, in uh, in this process where uh, in the McLaurin case, the argument is made that uh, while you could say that technically speaking, his placement in the classroom was not obstructing his view of the instructor or uh, his ability to hear the instructor, that it was having uh, psychological uh, effects that clearly uh, this uh, segregation or separate separation uh, uh, on, you know, supposedly uh, equal terms uh, was inherently uh, unequal. The separation made it inherently unequal. And there, in a sense, are the seeds uh, of the, uh, the Brown decision uh, four years later. Right? Exactly right, uh, David. Um, uh... If the test of uh, segregation's constitutionality had always been since 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, the University of Oklahoma came as close as you could to uh, achieving that formula. Uh, McLaurin had access to the same library, the same cafeteria, the same courses, the same professors as any white student. Uh, 
but was uh, confined to his own toilet, his own desk, his own uh, uh, um, place in the cafeteria. And by that time, other uh, black students were there, their own uh, places in uh, segregated dormitories. Uh, so the test before the court, the NAACP thought, aha, here is the chance to bring down segregation in and of itself. Uh, uh, and it was terribly risky. And there were many members of the NAACP, especially local branches who said, don't do this because what if the Supreme Court decides, uh, no, it's, uh, he's getting an equal education to white people. What's the big deal? Uh, that then other universities would copy the same uh, uh, procedures of segregating their black students uh, on the campus. So the Thurgood Marshall's decision to go forward uh, with this very risky case was, uh, was taking a chance. Uh, and as you say, it relied not on uh, the tangibles, how many books there were in the library, uh, the amount of scholarship money available to uh, blacks as opposed to whites. All of these tangibles seem to be in order. It's this uh, effect on the segregated, uh, on uh, their health, on their self-esteem, on their future pros uh, prospects on the, uh, the ability to uh, make friends with influential classmates and, uh, in the case of law school uh, that uh, they concentrated on. And as uh, Earl Warren said in Brown versus uh, the Board of Education uh, in 1954, May of 1954, uh, we're deciding today that uh, Plessy versus Ferguson was wrong, uh, even if the uh, tangibles are uh, equal. Right, right. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a hugely important precedent to, to Brown, but it's also a, a sort of consistency there in that if you look at Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson back in 1896, there's a, a hint uh, of that notion that uh, the separation itself uh, is the problem. Yeah. It doesn't matter if there's equality in facilities. Of course, there never really was. But uh, the, the act of the, the segregation itself uh, is a marker of uh, a perception of, in, of inherent inferiority. Yes, absolutely. It was yeah. a brilliant dissent. And he goes down in history as one of the great heroes of the civil rights uh, effort and one of the great uh, uh, dissents. Uh, in the history of the Supreme Court, I think. Right. So may maybe we could we could wrap up with with one final question uh, about about place. Uh, breaking down barriers is 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 a legal history. Uh, it, more than that, I think it's a human history. But I'd also suggest that it's a history uh, about place. And the three places that uh, deserve comment are the University of Oklahoma the city of Norman and the state uh, of Oklahoma. Can you just tell us a little about that, the barriers of segregation uh, in those three places that needed to be broken down and what uh, McLaurin's story and uh, uh, Ada Lois Sipwell Fisher's story uh, tell us about the transformation of these three places, uh, OU, Norman and, and uh, Oklahoma. And, and it's a long question I know, but uh, they're places we, 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 we know and we love and we care about deeply, uh, and they're places that are not uh, bereft of uh, racial politics and policies uh, in the present. So uh, what is the lesson for the places we love from uh, this powerful yeah. story that you've told? Uh, I'll take them in the reverse order. The, the okay. state uh, had a long tradition of uh, segregation. Uh, Oklahoma, as you know, was settled uh, in two directions. Kansans 
coming south, uh, Texans, Missourians, Arkansas uh, citizens coming up from the south and uh, often uh, veterans of the Confederate army and uh, descendants of slave owners. And they imposed a uh, almost a deep South uh, racial attitude on the rest of the state. Uh, and they spoke through the Democratic Party. There were a few Republicans who opposed uh, rigid segregation, but they soon found that was suicide politically and they stopped doing it. They became what were known as lily white Republicans. But the Democrats look at the Constitutional Convention of 1907, there were 112 uh, delegates, 99 were Democrat segregationists. Uh, and their leader, Alfalfa Bill Murray was a virulent and uh, committed uh, racist uh, politician. Uh, so there was uh, that uh, tradition that had to be addressed by anybody who like uh, Fisher and McLaurin wanted to uh, uh, get citizenship uh, for their people. Norman was a part of that uh, uh, attitude. Uh, it was settled mostly by uh, Southerners coming up from uh, Texas and uh, through Purs uh, Purcell. Uh, in, uh, the first question that they had to vote on was what should we call our county? The Republicans wanted to call it Lincoln County. The Democrats wanted to call it Cleveland County after the uh, president uh, who, between his two terms. Uh, and the vote was 645 for Cleveland and 300 and something for uh, Lincoln. Uh, the town was uh, violently uh, anti-black. There are many incidents that uh, I think we don't have time to go into, but brutality, uh, beating up, <clears throat> threatening, uh, panic at the thought that uh, Blacks might want to uh, register at the university. Uh, it was a sundown town, no Blacks permitted after sundown, uh, by uh, not by ordinance, but by an informal understanding. This changed uh, uh, in World War II when uh, the town wanted uh, the uh, Navy to come in uh, to uh, house their uh, bases on the north and the south ends of the campus, the north base and the south base. Uh, they wanted to stay all white, the town in general wanted to stay all white, but they also wanted the income and the uh, rise in property values and the, uh, the influx of uh, uh, new residents and the real estate boom that would come with uh, the Second World War. And so they, uh, uh, and Blacks uh, were in the Navy. They served as uh, uh, interns, as uh, construction workers, as uh, in the hospital, as interns, as uh, cooks and waiters and so on. Uh, so Norman was slowly coming to terms. Yeah. Uh, the university, uh, I believe there was always a sentiment against segregation at the university after uh, World War II. Uh, there is some polling done. Uh, it shows that the most uh, mature uh, students were most in favor of uh, breaking down segregation. Uh, Cross once told me that uh, the faculty was, as he put it, uh, his word, unanimous on behalf of uh, admitting black students. 
I questioned him about that. I thought that a faculty of 750 surely was not unanimous. And Cross said, quote, I know of no exceptions. Goodness. Uh, uh, well, after the cases, I think uh, the university gradually, very slowly uh, began to uh, uh, make uh, uh, token gestures toward uh, the appreciation of uh, black uh, uh, students. Uh, an important moment was uh, 1956 when uh, a, a great football player uh, was uh, uh, joined the team and uh, even the white racist had uh, to uh, uh, applaud his, not only his skill on the football field, he was a great running back, Prentice Gott, uh, but uh, also for his dignity, his gentlemanliness, his integrity. Uh, he changed many minds, I think, about race. Uh, but, you know, when George Henderson came in 1967, he still found no barriers to admission to the university, but a sort of isolate, social isolation. You don't see blacks and whites at the same dance or picnic or party. Uh, you don't see white black couples when uh, Henderson arrived, uh, but uh, that began to change partly because of him. And a white realtor had to break ranks with the, uh, with the industry, right? To, to, you know, a willingness to sell uh, I, George and his family a house. A, a white realtor had to break ranks yes. with the, oh, yeah. uh, the industry. Yeah. Henderson had trouble buying a house. Uh, his wife uh, had trouble buying a house and bought one. And then the uh, guy who was selling it called and said, could you, uh, would you mind if uh, you didn't come? Uh, finally, a realtor uh, with some courage uh, sold the Hendersons the house they still live in. I remember being at a dinner on the campus where uh, Dr. Henderson uh, introduced that uh, realtor uh, and thanked that realtor for having uh, shown that, that bravery. And uh, the book, I think, is, uh, is uh, a testament to uh, what, what we can do better, uh, how we can improve. We walk around this campus partly uh, through the guidance of, uh, of signage that you've written. Uh, and the story of the university and its history is is beautifully told and it's an institution uh, facing up to the racial complexities of its past. We see that uh, as we walk by uh, the now uh, old chemistry building, as we walk by the Ada Lois Supwell Fisher Memorial Fountain. Uh, I wanna thank you for telling this story for us uh, and reminding us of how vital the past is for us to be able to uh, operate uh, humanely uh, and appropriately uh, in the present with regard to race. The book, uh, Breaking Down Barriers, George McLaurin and the Struggle to End Segregated Education. Professor Levy, thank you so much for spending the time with us uh, to talk about this wonderful uh, and award-winning uh, recent book of yours. So Breaking Down Barriers is published, uh, of course, by our uh, superb University of Oklahoma Press, uh, as uh, have been uh, Professor Levy's first two volumes of the history of the University of Oklahoma, which I'd also encourage everybody to, uh, to read. Uh, thank you, David, for these uh, fine questions and for participating with me.